All right, welcome back. We're now going to talk about the sliding filament theory of, uh, of skeletal muscle contraction. So this this theory of muscle contraction, um, it it is named um, in part due to the uh, the action of which the uh, the myofilaments uh, undergo and how they move uh, to produce our large scale muscle contraction that we see. So our filaments, our myofilaments, our actin and mycin, are going to be moving and sliding um, across each other. Specifically, the the actin, the thin filament, is going to be sliding over the top and across the thick filament, the myosin. Um, but this theory is describing how the filaments are moving, and so. What you have, uh, in, in essence, is you have the, uh, the Z disks that are attaching adjacent thin uh, actin molecules. When the myosin pivots, uh, and we'll talk about how this, uh, how this works, when it moves and pulls the actin together, it pulls the two Z disks together, our Z lines. And remember, one Z, one Z disk to another Z disk is the sarcomere. And, and so when this whole sarcomere shortens across the entire muscle, you get overall muscle shortening, and this is what we see as a contraction. Okay, so in order for this whole process to occur, we've already seen in the previous part that we need calcium. We need our action potential uh, to help release the calcium from the SR, uh, but we also need ATP, and the ATP is going to be responsible for supplying the uh, the energy necessary for a muscle contraction. So this is why when you talk about cellular respiration and carbohydrate metabolism. We're doing all of that to make ATP, and we're using that ATP now in our muscle contraction process. Okay, so what you have is you have ATP bind uh, to our myosin head. Okay, uh, and so the the in this state the myosin head is not currently bound to to the actin. Okay, the myosin is not bound there. After the ATP binds, you have an enzyme called the myosin ATPase enzyme, which remember anything ending in ACE, ASE is an enzyme. It is going to split our ATP into two uh, products, ADP or adenosine diphosphate, and then uh, an inorganic phosphate. That's what the P subscript I means, an inorganic phosphate. When this happens, you have broken the bonds uh, in ATP and released some energy, and that energy is now transferred to the myosin head and it, and it reorients in a high energy uh, state. And this high energy state is uh, bound to the actin. So it bonds to the actin, and when it forms this, uh, uh, this structure, this is called cross bridge formation. Okay, so the myosin head has re-energized in this high energy position due to the, um, uh, due to the breaking of, of the, and the hydrolysis of the ATP, this energy is transferred to the myosin and it forms this cross bridge. Now, once uh, once it forms this cross bridge, you still have the ADP, the adenosine diphosphate, and our inorganic phosphate molecule still attached to the myosin head. These ADP and inorganic phosphate are going to be released, and when they're released, this also releases some energy, and this energy is enough for the myosin head to pivot, and when it pivots, because it's attached to the actin, it's going to pull the actin and flex the actin uh, along the myosin. Okay, so the myosin is actually going to be pulling the actin over top itself, and this is going to be moving the two Z discs or Z lines closer to each other, and this is going to cause shortening of the sarcomere or what we know as our muscle contraction. Okay, and so this whole process of the the myosin head being bonded to the actin and pivoting when the ADP and inorganic phosphate are released. This is called the power stroke. Okay, sometimes you'll see it called the working stroke as well, um, but we're going to refer to it as the power stroke. So here you can see, um, uh, I this one here starts at you know one, two, three, four. We should really start here at four. What you have is your ATP hydrolyzed into ADP and a phosphate. This causes the head to now be bonded and bound to the actin. So you can see here it is not, and here it is. You can see the actin, uh, the myosin head binding site on the actin here, they're exposed. And so we have, we would have had calcium already uh, bonded to the troponin, but we do not have ATP yet. So once you have ATP, it can form this cross bridge to uh, bind with the actin. When the ADP and the phosphate are at least here, now you can see this head goes from this, uh, this uh, configuration here, this high energy configuration, and it pivots 
And this, when it pivots, it is now pulling this actin myosin in. That's what this small arrow is representing. It's going to the left here. Uh, and this is our power stroke or our working stroke, okay? And so all of this energy is being supplied via the uh, via ATP and the hydrolysis of ATP. Uh, but here, whenever we perform this power stroke, we don't have ATP uh, bonded to the head anymore. We don't have the phosphate or the ADP anymore because they were released, right? And so in order to get this myosin head to unbind or de uh, detach from the actin, you have to have another ATP come and bind to it. So it is going to be bonded to our ATP, uh, I'm sorry, the myosin head is going to be bonded to the actin until we have a new ATP molecule come and bind to the head and now we revert back to our low energy configuration as opposed to our high energy configuration when we were attached to the actin. What you do with this ATP now is you hydrolyze it, you split it into an ADP and a phosphate and when you do that now you can re-energize um, and start the whole contraction process again. Okay, so um, that is the general process and walkthrough. So I would practice, you know, starting at one. What do we have? We have our ADP and our phosphate uh, attached to the head. Um, this was due to the a ATP hydrolysis. Um, when these two are released, you have the pivot or the the, the power stroke. This this process here. This is the cross bridge. When they're released, now we get our power stroke or our working stroke. Um, this pulls the actin over the myosin. So the so the, the actin is what's actually sliding across in the sliding filament theory. It's the two actins uh, that, the, that are being uh, bonded to the, the myosin heads. These actins are what are going to be uh, moving across uh, the top of the myosin. Uh, you then have the ADP and uh, phosphate released. You have a new ATP bond. This causes the bond to break between the myosin head and the actin. You have the hydrolysis of ATP again, and now you're recocked in your high energy uh, confirmation, and now you can start the process over again. So this is just showing with this view here that we can see, we see our thin filament here. This is going to be sliding in. And so you can imagine if each of these small myosin heads uh, are bonded to this thin actin filament, when these pivot, this is all going to move inward. This is all going to move inward, and you get this configuration down here. So this up here would be a relaxed sarcomere or a relaxed muscle this down here would be a contracted muscle and the reason you know that is because our z discs move closer together so here's a z, z line or z disc and here's another one and then here's this one down here they have moved inward because of the um, cross bridge formation and the power stroke of our myosin head acting on our thin actin filament and so when you look at a picture like this um, try to look and see you know what is happening? Um, what do we see going on? You can see the change in the band length. So our our A band is not going to change. Our A band is going to stay the same because we're always going to have the same degree of overlap, um, or not the same degree of overlap, but we're always going to have some uh, overlap here, and we're always going to have some overlap here. So that distance isn't really going to change a whole lot. Um, but our I band will change, okay, as well as our, our H zone. This H zone is just the thick filament, which isn't labeled on this image. Uh, but you can see our I band um, is this large because our uh, sarcomere is currently relaxed. When we perform the power stroke and we move our actin filaments closer together, now we have shortened this distance um, here between adjacent uh, uh, actin strands, and so this I band gets very, uh, very small. Okay, so whenever you look at a picture like this, try to walk through and talk yourself through uh, what exactly is going on here. So rigor mortis, and so you can imagine if we go back here, if we have this, this, this myosin head here bonded to actin, uh, and in order for this to detach, we have to have ATP come and bind to it, then we have to have it hydro hydrolyzed. What's going to happen if we don't have this ATP to bond to this? this myosin head. What, what's going to happen? Well, you get something called rigor mortis. Rigor mortis refers to the stiffness of death, rigor meaning uh, something stiff, and then mortis referring to, uh, you know, mortality or death. Um, and, and this is the state in which our muscles become very, uh, very rigid, very firm, uh, and very uh, hard. And this is due, I have due to, I, I have written here due to 
a lack of ATP hydrolysis, and it is due to a lack of ATP hydrolysis, but in more, you know, I guess accurately, it's due to the lack of ATP bonding to the myosin head in the first place. So if we go back and when you don't have this, this ATP bonded to this myosin head, this is currently, th this state right here, number two, this is in a contracted state. This myosin head has performed the power stroke. And so if you contract your muscle, that's in a that's currently in a a power stroke. You're currently contracted, and so if you don't have ATP to come and bind to the myosin head to release that, you're going to stay in a state of contraction for some set period of time. Now, obviously, you wouldn't stay in it forever. We know that rigor mortis can show up in as little as um, uh, 12 to 24 hours, possibly even sooner. I, I can't remember exactly. Um, uh, so it, it obviously doesn't stay forever, um, and as time goes on, uh, your myofilaments, the muscles itself, the different proteins begin to break down, and so that when there's when that begins to break down, you have um, you have a uh, a, a total kind of uh, breakdown of your muscle tissue, and so this prevents the contraction from being sustained. Um, but you do see it if you ever see a uh, an animal that has been uh, you know, inadvertently hit on the side of the road and has died. Uh, if you pass it at the right time, you may notice that its legs are sticking perfectly up or perfectly out to the side. Very rigid. If you tried to move that, which you don't, don't try to move it. Don't touch it. That's gross. But if you were to, uh, it would be very firm. It would be very hard and rigid. And it's because that animal has is in a current state of uh, rigor mortis uh, that is that is happening post mortem or after death. Okay, so. Uh, in order to relax our skeletal muscle now, we know that we had acetylcholine bind to the receptor uh, first, the very one of the very first stages, uh, very first steps. Um, you have to have that acetylcholine broken down. And so you have acetylcholine esterase, or that enzyme, go and break down your acetylcholine into acetic acid and choline, and then this prevents further and continued stimulation. These products can then be uh, put back together uh, to form acetylcholine again for future use, right? Uh, you have calcium uh, is actively pumped back into the SR and binds to this uh, this protein here called uh, calsequestrin. Now, notice that it said that I have actively pumped back. So, within our sarcoplasmic reticulum, there's a high concentration of calcium. Outside of the SR and the sarcoplasm, there's generally a low concentration of calcium. Even after we release some calcium from the SR into the sarcoplasm at the beginning of a muscle contraction, there's still a greater concentration on the inside. And so in order to move from low concentration to high concentration, you have to use active transport. So you have to use energy in the form of ATP. So we're going to be actively pumping it back in here. Uh, once calcium unbinds from the troponin tropomyosin complex, it will reorient, reconfigure to block the myosin binding sites uh, on the actin. Uh, this prevents uh, cross bridge formation. Our I bands become broader again, our Z lines move further apart, and if our Z lines move further apart, our sarcomere moves further apart, and if this happens across the entire muscle, our entire muscle gets longer, and so that is relaxation of the muscle, okay? So we're going to stop there, and we will pick up uh, with uh, part six in the next video.